This is Joe Larson from the 505 on Racing Show, live every Monday night from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Watch as I dive into everything from NASCAR and motor racing, only on InRavio.com. InRavio.com. The world of advertising has changed. Radio, TV, and newspaper revenues have declined drastically. Why? Because businesses have realized that advertising return on investment isn't what it used to be. So what can we do about it? Well, that's easy. Advertise online. Own a local restaurant, real estate agency, or even a national retail chain? Whatever your business, InRavio can get your message out there. And we can do it at a fraction of the cost. Call today and see the difference for yourself. This isn't TV. This isn't radio. This is InRavio.com. Hello again, everybody. This is Joe Larson. You're watching the 505 on Racing Show. Welcome. Hope everybody had a good week. The weather finally here in Long Island is, is nice. It's, uh, it's a far cry from the winter we had. It's, it's funny here in Long Island. We, we don't have spring anymore. We go right from winter to summer. And uh, some of these Friday nights and Saturday nights at these racetracks, it gets cold. It gets very cold. You know, the day starts out nice, you go there, you have a short sleeve shirt on, you, you throw your blanket down on the bench, and once that sun sets, it gets cold. But that's just how it is. That's just how it is. Anyway, what do I want to talk about tonight? Stafford, the NASCAR wheel and modified tour event at Stafford was, was postponed due to rain twice, the original date, and they went back a week later and got rained out. They're going to try again this Friday. And that leads me to what I want to talk about tonight, at least in the, in the first half hour anyway. Uh, it's a Pomona's nightmare, rain. You, you have to go along with it. You, you can't, and when I say you can't, there are some promoters that do, cancel shows based on a forecast. Now living on Long Island, our weather patterns here are kind of unique because you know, sometimes we get that wrap around from the, from the north you know, and it comes past us and goes back and around and it comes back and hits us again. Sometimes it just comes out from the west and goes right across. But here on Long Island, it could be pouring in New York City and the sun will be shining at our local racetrack here at Riverhead Raceway. And there are times that it's vice versa. You know, it's, it's pouring at the raceway and people on the west end of the island, they're saying, wow, it's, it's gorgeous here. Why'd they pull the plug? So it's a tough call as a promoter, and I, I never really was a promoter, per se, of a racetrack. I, yeah, I've promoted events. I, I promoted the uh, Battle of the Sexes race that we had at the ISO Speedway back in, I believe that was 1979, where it was men against women. And, and to make it equitable, we took the men and put them in the women's race cars, because there was a women's division that raced at ISO Speedway. And we took the men, uh, the women, and we put them in the men's race cars. So you, you, you had a little bit of equity there, and some kind of a balance. And, and if I remember correctly, Sharon Howard won the event, driving her now or then husband's figure eight car, Bill Howard. She won the event. Um, and it was very interesting you know, to, to watch this event. But uh, that was my only attempt at ever trying to promote a race. And uh, again, that was such a long time ago. That was like 35 years ago. And uh, I, I, I remember it so well. And it all started out as a joke. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. But again, as, as, a, as a promoter's nightmare, weather. Now, what do you do? 
At what point do you cancel? What time do you pull the plug? What time do you say, hey, you know what? We got to go for it. A couple of weeks ago, I was out at Riverhead Raceway here along the line, and, and the rain, there was forecast of spotty showers. It would rain, they dry the track, get a race in, it would rain, dry the track. And, and my hat's off to the track crew that I, because those days were feverishly. It was a night that they couldn't run the figure eights because the figure eight course was, was just inundated with water and it just wasn't safe to race. But what I saw out there that night is not only did I see the track crew going nuts trying to make it happen, but also the facilities coordinator, John Edward. He, he was out there himself trying to get this place ready for the races. And, and this guy was, was tearing his hair out. I, you know, listening on the scanner, I, you know, I, I, I bring my scanner when I go to River and I, and I listen to what's going on. And you know, everybody wanted him. You know, John, come here. John, go there. John, go to the office. John, go here. John. And, and he's out there trying to get the track ready and keep it. You know, you, once you lose the track in the rain, you got to redo it. You got to start over. And you know, guys are out there. There was a guy in a blunderbuss out there driving around. Uh, he must have did 200 laps. And at one point, he was the only car on the racetrack. He wasn't giving up. It was kind of funny. But again, it's, it's a promoter's nightmare. And you, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you know you're going to lose your shirt because nobody's going to come. So what do you do? You, you, sometimes you got to go for it. Now, unfortunately, I, I, that first night at Stafford, that, that tour race, I, I was there, obviously. I was there. And all of it, we're watching the radar in our cell phones, and we're watching. And there's a patch. There was a patch that was just west of the racetrack, a patch of green, red, and yellow. That's serious stuff coming. I, I'm not a meteorologist, but um, there was some serious weather coming. We have the cars pushed out in the back at Stafford, you know, Im impounded, and I go back there to just cover it, just in case the rain goes. So I can walk all the way back there. Now, if you've never been to Stafford, that's a far walk. I get all the way back, and you know, they call it, you know, because I heard the uh, announcer, Ben Dodge, I heard him say, you know, the, the show was called. There's some dangerous weather coming, lightning, high winds. And uh, you know, please go to your cars immediately. And within minutes, it was coming down. Of course, they rescheduled for the following week. It rains, and now it's rescheduled for this upcoming Friday. But rain, it's a promoter's nightmare. Now, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the the social medias, you know, throughout the week, and and you, and you listen and not listen, but you read what people are saying. And there's some people you just don't get it. You just don't get it. It's so easy to bash a promoter or a track operator. It's so easy to bash officials. And you know, you, you, you have to be place blame somewhere. You, know? you, you just can't sit back as a fan and say, you know, wow, wow, they did a good job. I, I, I have yet to, to, to see somebody or hear somebody you know, go out and say, wow, they, they're really trying here. It was like they were inconvenienced because of the weather. It's not the promoter's fault. And, and, and even when there's stuff that goes on at a racetrack, now, there's no secret that I was an official for 18 years. And no matter who's in charge or what job you have as official, you're no good as far as many of the competitors are. And, and most of their friends and family who sit up in the grandstand that I refer to as fence grabbers. Why, why do I do that? Um, because they're sitting on the fence holding and they're looking like, you know, they're on the outside looking in or the inside looking out, however you want to look at it. And they just are so doggone negative. And I've been around for racetracks closing. I was around when Freeport closed. I was around when ISO closed. And, you know, once a track closes, it just doesn't sit there and the weeds grow through the cracks in the pavement and the grandstands, you know, the wooden part, the center ridge, it's gone. There's only one place left here on Long Island, and, and years ago, years ago, I can remember Bob O'Rourke, you know, late Bob O'Rourke, he was a race director at, at Islip and, and Riverhead Raceway. He said, Joe, once it's gone, it's gone. Nobody's building a new one. And we got to keep fighting for what we have. And I, I'm, I'm reading the last few days, and, and all I saw was, was negative. And I saw the right people, PR people, 
and, and some, and, and I'm going to call them brown nosing people who, who want to say the right thing, who are, who are going against these bashers. But you know what? You know, and, and how do I put this? I, I've been accused of bashing racetracks. I've been accused of bashing NASCAR. I've been accused of bashing, you know, race teams. And, and I don't think what I've done is bash. I think what I've done, and it's not that I think what I've done, I, I know what I've done is I've, how do I put this? Um, constructive criticism? That's not bashing. Maybe how it's done or how it's taken. See, you know, I, I know a lot of people come on and, and, and listen and watch this show to see what I'm going to say next, cause so they could go out and tell whomever and misconstrue everything I say and, you know, hey, Joe spent two hours on a show, you know, bashing this or bashing that and the other thing. And, and I remember I had this, this discussion with somebody that, that, that said I did exactly that. And I said, no, I didn't. Now, what are you talking about? What show are you talking about? And when, when I went to the archives, and because our shows are archived, so if you ever miss one, you can go on and look in radio.com. And I went on to the archive. I said, maybe I miss something, because sometimes this two hours for me goes by like minutes. So I go, I said, maybe, maybe the guy's right. Let me, let me go look. So I went and looked, and the discussion that was in question lasted all of 17 seconds of two hours. And... I didn't say anything. The chat room did. But they told that guy who, who wasn't really listening, you know, I oh, bash, bash, bash. Well, I didn't. Then there's the other people who go on and they know what the facts is, or are, I should say, <laughs> what the facts is, what the facts are, facts are and, and, and they say nothing. That's just as worse. So, you know, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem, and, and I've been saying that for a long time. But to sit there and, and bash your local racetrack and just bash it, bash it, bash it, as you sit in the grandstand sucking down a beer or, or munching on a hot dog, or you're in the pit area walking around because you have no way to hang your hat, no team to work with, and no cars that want to even be bothered with you working on them, you want to sit there and bash, and you want to bash officials. Well, let me tell you something. I, I was an official, like I said earlier, for 18 years, and no official puts on his official shirt and his official pants and his official hat and cold, on the cold nights with the intention of going to the racetrack and screwing up. No official puts in the hours that they put in for the pay that they get to go there and screw up. Every official that puts on an official uniform goes to that racetrack to do the best doggone job that they could do in, in the effort of racing. And they're not perfect. They're not going to see everything. They're not going to make every call correct and you're the fan, the crew, the driver, the car owner's eyes. They're going to make a call based on the facts at the moment that they saw that were presented to them. And, and I just, what I'm trying to say is I, you guys and gals that are out there that are in, on the social networks bashing your local racetrack, whether it's Riverhead, Stafford, Cottage Grove, Speedway in Oregon, whatever track is in your neighborhood, if you ever want to go there and bash, you need to stop. If you're that unhappy, go do something else. Just like in a marriage, if you're that unhappy, you leave. If you're going to sit there and bash your local racetrack because you don't like a call that was made against somebody that you like or that you help or that you are involved with, go do something else. Because I know these officials work hard at what they're doing and for the pay that they get, that they're there sometimes 9 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the morning. And then on some Saturday nights, they don't even get to go home because it's a Sunday event. And they're a little tired and maybe they're a little cranky. And, and you approach them with an attitude, and you're the 99th person that approached them with an attitude. You, they're not going to sit there with a smile on their face. Okay? And if you're going to go up to an official screaming and yelling, you're not going to get their attention. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to continue on this little talk about sticking up for officials, sticking up for race promoters, and what it takes to run a racetrack. We'll be back.
Hey, Beatle fans, I'm Glenn Calderon. And I'm Lucy Diamond. Join us every Tuesday night from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time for Beatles Across the Universe. On InRadio.com. Broadcasting to the world. Catch, Catch us. us. Paul Brown and the Killing Devils. Alternative progressive rock like you've never heard before. Over a million views on YouTube. New York City Village Voice says Paul is a gifted singer, songwriter, and musician with one of the best progressive rock bands on the planet. LA Underground Music Exchange calls him the only modern American band to cover every genre well. Pick up the albums Black Widow Tears, Red Spider, and The Wizard's Dawn, now on iTunes. And get to Facebook.com forward slash Killing Devils to keep up with the latest info. Transmission of lice occurs from being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Like catching a cold or a flu. You have guaranteed peace of mind in every bottle of Got Lice because all of our products are completely natural. And organic. But strong enough to cover all your lice removal needs while being safe and effective. Our professional technicians are specially trained with our exclusive proven technique to successfully comb out head lice. We come right to your home at your convenience. Whenever you want us. We bring everything needed to perform a successful and complete comb out while eliminating your head lice. And we leave you with our exclusive complimentary products to use for the next 10 days following our treatment for free our technicians also check all family members who have been exposed to lice please visit us on our website today at gotlice.co or feel free to call 24 hours a day seven days a week at 646-257-0121 the world of advertising has changed. Radio, TV, and newspaper revenues have declined drastically. Why? Because businesses have realized that advertising return on investment isn't what it used to be. So what can we do about it? Well, that's easy. Advertise online. Own a local restaurant, real estate agency, or even a national retail chain? Whatever your business, in Radio can get your message out there. And we can do it at a fraction of the cost. Call today and see the difference for yourself. This isn't TV. This isn't radio. This is in Radio.com. For over 60 years, Hanson Carpet has put the customer first, providing only the finest quality products and service. And Hanson Carpet is so much more than just carpet. We also carry a wide selection of window blinds and shades, and our licensed and insured technicians can service any of your flooring or window covering needs. Browse our huge selection of laminate, carpet, linoleum, vinyl, and tile. Stop by our showroom today or visit HansonCarpet.com. No matter what your project, Hanson Carpet has got you covered. In Revio.com. Hey, we're back. Way back. Yeah, I was going scrolling through the chat room, seeing what we're going to talk about. I, I guess there was an incident here at the local racetrack here in Long Island where, where a car got sideways and stalled and sat, I guess, sideways on the racetrack uh, for, I guess, what they're saying is a half a lap. Now, I, I chatted back a half a lap at Riverhead Raceway. It was about six seconds. And I guess that's the official's fault. Uh, it's not the fault of the spotter of the car that crashed into him to say, there's a car sideways in a racetrack, or six seconds is a long time. Um, it's the official's fault, there was no yellow. Now, I've, I've flagged a few races, I've, I've flagged uh, some events over my lifetime. Um, I think I've done just about every official's job that was, I, except for tech, because I'm not a tech guy. <laughs> I mean, you know, post-race kind of tech. I, you know, I, I, I was an undercarriage guy, I was a body guy, I was an interior guy, I was an SFI guy. 
But you know, I'm not you know I'm not tearing your motor apart and looking for what's right and wrong because I, I wouldn't know where to begin. You know, when they say the first steps a minute. But anyway, um, all right now now it's over one lap. Originally it said in the in the chat it was a half a lap. So it starts 11 seconds. So as a flag, and I flagged, I flagged a 75 lapper at Riverhead years ago, uh, many years ago, uh, when I first became an official. And I flagged assorted other races. I flagged some modified tour practice sessions for an hour and a half, two hours. Um, but well, let, me, let me explain what happens, and, and I'm going to talk from the flagman's point of view. If the flagman or woman is doing what they're supposed to do, and that's take directive from the official in charge, whether it's a race director, series director, chief steward, assistant chief steward, third assistant chief steward, fourth assistant chief steward, once removed, whatever it may be, you know, the, 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 the facilities coordinator, whoever that flagman takes director from, the head scorer, I, I don't know, every track's different, that flag person will see the situation, hit his radio button, I got a car sideways, wherever. Uh, at that point, he or she is supposed to be told, put the yellow out or give it a sec, see if they get rolling on their own. I wasn't there this night with, on, in the incident, but I'm thinking that's maybe what might have happened. Because a flag guy, and I'm going to tell you a little story, a little quick thing. Bob Slade, NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour flag went for years and years and years. Um, I'm working pit road, and the tower didn't see a wreck. He goes, I'm putting it out, wreck in turn one. And at this racetrack, and I don't remember what it was, but I remember the situation. There's a, 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 a two by four, or a couple of two by fours in a window post. You're blocked from the tower, because I, I worked at this racetrack at, up in the tower. You can't see over there. So the flagman knew that. He puts out the yellow, boom, 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 boom. The next event, he was brought into the office and they ripped him a new one because he is not to throw out the flag until he's directed to. Now, there was a wreck in, in this incident, but at the incident this, this past Saturday, from what I understand, it was a spin, the car sat there. As a race director, as a series director, as a former chief steward, I'm going to sit there and hope the guy goes because. The worst thing one is, is another caution, because cautions breed cautions. And on a touring series, in the top three series, you bring out a caution. Each caution's at least five laps on the yellow where the laps count. At your local racetrack, the laps don't count on the, on the yellow. So you're sitting there on the yellow, crew, now, OK, boom, you call it, boom, and you get the whole field. Now that's a whole lap has passed by. Now everybody slows down. Now you're into lap two. And then the, the, the safety crew or the track who goes in, they move the car or get it going or give it a push. Now that's lap three. The scorers at this point then put the field up back in order. That's lap four. They check it as it goes by one more time. Maybe there's a guy who thinks he's in another spot. He goes, that's lap five. Show him one to go with the line. That's six. Go green. That's seven laps. That's if nobody went into the pits. That's if the gate never got open. Nobody went in. They're going to wait for. So you hope that the car moves. All right, so let's say it was a lap, 11 seconds, okay. You're hoping, by the time the flag guy goes to his radio and says, I got one sideways in the backstretch, and they have a meeting to discuss what they're going to do, you know, well, you know, maybe they didn't have a meeting, I don't know, I wasn't there. But you know what, you know, this bashing of officials has to stop. I, and I, I take it personal. I got accused of doing so many things as an official that finally at that one point I, I, I sat in my office one night with my guys and, and a couple of gals, and I sat there, you know, we had a couple of beers and we had some, you know, some lobster from, you know, Captain Picarell. He always brought us, you know, lobster and shrimp and stuff. And, I, and I, that was pretty good. But anyway, we're sitting there and I, and, and I said, guys, guys, are, are we that terrible? Do we miss every call? I don't think we do. Let's keep doing what we do. And that's when I started the thing where I would bring people up to the ramp and, and ask them what happened. Chris Chirico was, the year that I brought him up, Chris Chirico was the blunderbuss champion at Riverhead Raceway. And it was back in the day where they had 40 plus blunderbuss cars and making the show was the hard part. And he didn't make the show that night. He still became the champion that year. And Chris Chirico stood at my side and it was an incident right in front of us in turns three and four. Chris, what did you see? He goes, I didn't see it. Same thing I had the 
multi-champion Tom Kraft on the ramp with me on the night that you know, he, he didn't make it or he wasn't running or something. And yeah, what you, he goes, and I, I, I quote, he goes, I didn't see it. He goes, I, I, I could tell you what happened from my experience, but I didn't see it. Because you don't see everything. And the bigger the racetrack, the less you see. And the more people you have, you know, your eyes in the sky or eyes on the roof or eyes in the corners or whatever, your cornerman, whatever it is, it's, it's, you're not going to see every little bump and grind. See, as a crew guy, what car are you watching? You're watching your car, the car that you work on. Every lap, every turn, every second of every lap. You're watching your guy. All right? So, um, so what happens is the time that your guy gets sideways, you're going to say he got shoved out of the way. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But ah, what it, it is what it is. But you know, there's this, this bashing that's going on in, on in the social media and in the, in the, in the internet um, of people who are doing a hard job trying to make it happen. I'm just not for it. And I know a lot of people don't like what I'm saying, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking facts here. You know, again, I was an official for, for quite some time. And uh, uh, I, I've officiated over 6,000 events in, in, in my tenure as an official. And that's not a number I came up with, that's the number that UPS came up with when they had me up for a job at, uh, at, at, at UPS NASCAR Marketing. They just went through the schedule and they, and they included heat races and everything. But uh, I don't know. And, and, and I know myracenews.com thinks I'm not being objective here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm being factual. Um, I guess it depends on what side of the fence that you're on. And the side of the fence I'm on today is that I'm tired of people bashing officials. Because what happens is when officials get bashed, then all of a sudden they're no good and everybody wants a new guy. And, and then the new guy comes in and, and with the no time at all, the new guy's getting bashed. It's because nobody likes the head guy. Because they have to make you know, some tough decisions. Some tough decisions. You know? and, uh, and, and, and I understand that. You know, every, this guy's sitting there, everybody's going by him. I, I wasn't there. I don't, I don't know what the incident was or why, but I know a flag man is not supposed to put out the yellow unless they're directed to. And if uh, the eyes on the ramp or the eyes in the tower or the eyes on the roof or whatever the, the officials watching the race from um, aren't at that moment at that time, remember it's a short track, you turn in 11, 12 second laps, stuff happens real fast. So where's the spotter? I said that earlier. Where's the spotter? It's a car sideways, wherever it might be. Back it down. Go low, go high, go wherever. It's just, I don't know. But, you know, I saw a lot of stuff on Facebook today that, that, that I just didn't like, and, and not that anybody cares what Joe likes or, or doesn't like. But, uh, you know, a lot of cars got wrecked. You know, not only this side of the river, but a lot of these short tracks across the country. You know, you, you have, somebody said to put it to me once, you have two race cars that are about 88 inches wide and about 130 inches long going for the same piece of racetrack at the same time. Not because they want to wreck the other guy, because the hole open for a split second. At 60 miles an hour, you're going 100 feet a second. At 90 miles an hour, you're going 150 feet a second. You make that decision to fill that hole at the same time that the other guy does, you're going to hit, you're going to touch. You know, you're going to definitely touch. And, and you're right, golf guy. There are three sides to every story. And, you know, it's all depending on, on how you looked at it, how you saw it. I, I said, I think, a couple of weeks ago, it's like when you watch it, you know, you're standing on the corner and there's a car accident and there's five people that saw the accident. There'll be five different points of view. You know, it, it just was. And, 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 you, and you're right, New York Rangers Stanley Cup, woo uh, go Rangers. You know, ever since the internet was open, the local track has been bashed. And, um, and the officials have changed over multiple times, and, and you're absolutely correct. You know, it's a, um, and, and because you know, I, I, I tell people that get on the computer behind phony names, this is, I call them computer muscles. You know, I, I, I used to tell people, because I'd go on the, the Long Island Jam when I was uh, an official, hey, look, I'm in my office every Saturday at 9 a.m. Come talk to me. I'm there every, every Saturday. 
and my phone number was public. It, you know, call me up. Want to talk about it? Call me up. And uh, only one guy came to my actually two. The first one was Raymond Erie, and, and we shared tapes. We watched each other's tapes of an incident. And uh, one was uh, Danny Turbish. And, um, and when we were all said and done, it was, we shook hands, everything was fine. Uh, the only two guys in, in, the, in the four or five years that I was out there that took advantage of that, you know. But, you know, be, you know, take ownership of what you're going to say. If, if there's something that you don't like, say that. Don't, don't bash officials. Don't, you know, sit there, uh, the officials are no good, they this, they that, the other thing. Don't, they, they, just say, say, hey, from my point of view, as a fan, as a car owner, as a crew chief, as a crew member, as a driver, I don't like this situation, and here's why. Take ownership. Take ownership. Because, you know, just sit there and just bash for the sake of bashing. You know, I'll tell you what, you know, I, I, I saw a post today, and, and somebody was saying that they can't wait for the bulldozers to come to bulldoze the racetrack. Are you kidding? Uh, you're kidding. Somebody would say that. Uh, and, and I don't know who said it, and I don't really care who said it, but they said it. They, they said, they can't wait for that. And don't get me wrong, there were times that I wish that would have happened, don't get me wrong, but I didn't go say that. And, and it's something that's said in anger at the moment, but when you write it down like that, you know, man, that's, that's just not a good thing. It's not a good thing, you know? Um, again, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem, you know? Sit back and say, what can I do to make this better? You know, and I'm not, I'm not looking for a pat on the back, but you know, after I had that wreck in 96, I had a long talk with the Cromedies, many long talks, the Barbara and Jim Cromedy, the owners and promoters of Red Race, right? And I had a long talk with them, and we went back and forth, and I told them that I wanted to be an official, and, you know, it was the whys and why nots and how comes, and, and, and I said, basically, because nobody should be hurt the way I was. And, um, and, you know, and forget that pizza box firewall. Story. That's a bunch of nonsense. Yeah, did the car have a pizza box firewall? Yeah, but I never raced it that way. So let's just get that out there. But somebody else did. Um, I'm not going to mention their name. But um, and, and they asked me why. And I said, when I rolled into the racetrack with my race car, and, and the official said to me, this is the same car as last year? Yep. Boom, here's your sticker. That doesn't happen today. I hope not. But that's what was going on. And if you were in the end with certain officials, you know, you got away with certain things. And, um, and you go, you got practice sessions and you had all kinds of nonsense. And you were able to run different parts and different gears and different rear ends and different trannies. And you're able to manipulate the rules to fit your race cars. But those are just how it was then. So I didn't like a lot of stuff that was going on. And, you know, I, my first year as an official, my job was just to keep an eye on figure eight cars. I had no real assignment. I was walking around on crutches or a cane or whatever, I think both. And uh, I can remember measuring bumpers with a piece of tape on my pants. I had so many measures. I had Hank Ciliati, he was, a, he was the gay guy uh, with me. And, and I said, Hank, measure up 14 inches on my pants and let's put a piece of tape. And we did. So I would lean up against somebody's bumper and say, hey, you know, your bumper's a little too high, a little too low. Oh, come on, how do you know? I said, I could tell just by looking at it. Nobody saw the tape that was on my pants. You know, uh, and then quickly I went from doing that to the, the head of guy. In fact, one of the tech officials, who's still a tech official now, back in 1998, I remember a comment that he made because he didn't realize I was standing right there. He said, only in America can a mediocre figure eight job become a head official of a race shark. You got that right. Only in America. You know, uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, you know, the golf guy, I, I got to agree with that. You know, It's easy to be a tough guy from behind a computer. It's not just Riverhead. It's the whole way. It is. Not just racing. It's every sport, every business, you know, and, and uh, I don't know. It's just one of those things. But, you know, all I'm asking folks is, is is, you know, like I said before, somebody said I'm, I'm not being object objective, so um, they clicked off. And I respect that, you know. You don't like what I'm saying, you don't have to listen, no, obviously. But, you know, being on that side of the fence, it's like you could do nothing right. And I, I still think a racetrack or, or, or seriously, there should be a hierarchy. There should be a, here's the guy in charge, and here's everybody else. It's a pyramid thing. The guy in charge is at the top all alone. Now that guy 
divides the duties up. All right, I'm the head official. You're the head tech person. You're the you know the the head scorer, and you're the you know head flag guy, and you're the head track crew guy. And then those people have people working for them. The head scorer has other scorers who are scoring, and the tech guy has other people who are doing tech, and the track crew has other people who are doing. I mean, even down to the tow truck operator, there's one tow truck guy who's in charge. No, no matter what track it's at, and it's it's the pyramid. The top guy, he takes the heat. He's the one everybody wants to knock off. It's easy to knock the guy off at the top. Easy. You can knock him off. All that's going to happen is somebody from within the ranks is going to go to the top slot, or they're going to bring in somebody from the outside. 99 times out of 100, it's somebody from within the ranks who's been around. And um, you know, when, you, when you look at that, when you, you know, where are officials coming from? Who are the officials at our local racetracks? Again, whether it's in Connecticut, New Jersey, Florida, Pennsylvania, Oregon, Canada, wherever. Most of the officials are former race car drivers or race car owners or crew guys, somebody involved with teams. And supposedly they're, they're put in that position because of the knowledge that they have and the knowledge that they could share with others. Do your hands get tied as an official? Absolutely. Why? People say, why? Why would your hands be tied? Mike Hilton put it to me one day, we were up at Loudon, I was working a race, and he said to me, Joe, what we do here is put on a show. We got to put on the best possible show that we can for our fans and our sponsors. Because without our sponsors, we can't put it, the show on. Without our fans, there's no need to put a show. All right? So all we do is put on a show. We got to make that a good show. And, and he said this to me after I was working the tower, I believe it was a nationwide race, and we want like forever green. We need to go caution. He kept saying, Joe, we need a caution. So I'm thinking he's just saying that. Yeah, we need a caution. Yeah, we need a... Not Joe, we need a caution. And we went on and on. And finally, he called for the caution. It was debris. And, and that's when he gave me that little talk about putting on a show. Now, of course, who's all upset about that? Now, the guy who's leading has a half a lap lead. Now, all of a sudden, the field gets punched up. Um, they're going to blame the guy who they think made the call. You know, why did he go? There was no need for that. You know, it, it's just like the debris that's up against the wall. That that one that drives me crazy, especially on a short track. You got the debris six inches off the wall, up in turn two. Now we got the debris on track. All right, where? Where is it? Up in turn two, next to the. How far? Well, yeah, it's. A, my philosophy is this: if it's if it's up against the wall in like the third groove of an asphalt track that nobody races in. If anybody hits that degree, they got bigger problems than the debris. They're already going in the fence. Just saying. Just saying. You know, it's, it's, it's just incredible. It, and it's incredible how, how, how can I put this? Going back a, many, many years ago, the late Walt Edson was sitting in the office, and there was a guy who came in, he wanted to be an official. And we, oh, we interviewed the guy, of course, we're going to talk to him. And, Walt, you know, was very positive. I'm thinking Walt's putting this guy, giving him a shirt next week. Guy walks out, Walt goes, I can't make that guy an official. Why not? He goes, did you see his hands? I'm like, you know, at this point, I'm looking at my own hands. He goes, there was no grease under his fingernails. This guy never worked on a car. What is he going to know? And, and not that I agreed with that, but that was his philosophy. He wanted guys who got their hands dirty. He wanted guys who... who crawled underneath these cars and knew every inch of them. He needed guys who raced them, wrecked them, fixed them, built them. He needed those kind of guys. And, uh, you know, I wasn't that kind of guy. I, I guess he inherited me because, you know, uh, because after talking to the Cromedies, who I, I'll tell you what, the Cromedies, you know, they grew up in age, Barbara and Jim Cromedy. Um, for the most part, they were always good to me. For the most part, a lot of people sitting back, come on, Joe, where's Joe, what they do to him? Um, we didn't always agree. We didn't always agree. Simple as that. But I don't always agree with my brother. It doesn't change the relationship I have with him. You know, think about it. You don't always agree with your wife. You still love her. Or your husband. You still love him. Or your boyfriend, your girlfriend. You don't always agree. Sometimes you have to agree to disagree. And, 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 and hope for commonality. Hope to come reach common ground. You know, if... If you want to be a puppet, and I know I was referred to as, 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 as a puppet, 
when I was a, at Riverhead. Um, and, and I think the people that referred to me as being a puppet um, have had the opportunity to see that people own the racetrack, they're going to run it their way. Either you do it their way or you don't. And if you do it their, own, their way, sometimes you're going to catch a lot of heat. And if you don't do it their way, you're going to catch a lot of heat. The first one, you're going to get a lot of heat from the teams. The other one, you get a lot of heat from the, from the owners of the place. So you've got to decide who you want, who you're going to take the heat from. You're going to take the heat from the people paying your paycheck or giving you that envelope at the end of the night, or you're going to take heat from people that you only see for a couple hours on Saturday. I mean, I'd like to be able to not take heat from anybody, because I'm not good at taking heat. But, you know, um, <laughs> you know what you've got to do is, you got to make decisions. Sometimes they're tough decisions, and that's why, you know, again, we're talking about, you know, why you can't officiate by committee, why you need to have a guy at the top so that when that team comes up to you at the end of the night or during the race, whenever they come talk to you or whenever you ask to speak to them, that there's one man or woman answerable. One. Yeah, I made that call. I made that decision. Now, that decision was based on sound judgment, based on information given to you by other officials. But somebody has to be accountable for that decision. Just like the flag guy can't throw a yellow because he wants to or she wants to. Somebody somewhere has to direct him. And, and maybe that's what's missing at some of those local short tracks. Nobody's taking ownership or nobody's taking control because they don't want to upset promoters or they don't want to upset their friends or they don't want to set up you know, other people. Or, or at the end of the night when they go to get a hot dog and a beer, they, they, they want to get it. I, 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 you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. You know. It's just one of those things, you know. And, and whether it's whether you're racing go-karts, whether you're racing on your weekly level, whether you're racing a touring series, or whether you're an official in a top three. And you, you got to make tough decisions. And, you know, I, and I know I, I upset some people sometimes with some of the things that I've said and done, and not, not only here, but also in, uh, in, um, as an official, even as a race car driver. You know, it's just one of those things, you know, stand up for what you believe in. That's all I'm saying. And, you know, I, I, you know, you got to agree to disagree sometimes. And, and you know, right now I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing to disagree with some of the stuff that's going on with, with, with my racing situation. And I have a lot of people trying to make it happen. And then it just seems everywhere we turn, it just, it's not happening. And, you know, it used to be if you had the money and the equipment, you'd go racing. And a place to go racing now. Now it's it's so different, and um, but uh, we're, we're not going to go there right now. We're going to leave that one alone. We're going to definitely leave that one alone. But you know, with, with with that being said, um, I just just want to you know talk about that. I mean, it, it's tough. You know, it's tough doing this job, and it's tough being an official. It's tough being a promoter. It's tough being a track operator. And and when you think about it, when you think about a track operator. Their window to make money, because they're in that business to make money. They're not in that business to be charitable. They're not in that business to lose money. So you take a 52-week year, a calendar, that they really only have 20 to 26 weeks to race, but they don't have weeks. They have 20 to 26 days to get their show and to make their money. So now think about this. Now, what, what's 26 days in the course of a year? Well, you know, it would be like the equivalent of, you know, let's say you couldn't work because it rains, but you work every week, so it would be like you can't work for two solid weeks. For two solid weeks, you have no income. Think about that. Do you think track operators, do you think they want to cancel shows? Do you think, a lot of people go, oh, they're going to cancel this show. There's going to be nobody in the stands. They're not going to be able to pay the purses and pay the bills. Do you think, you know, track operators look at that? I mean, they, they, I'm sure they look at that to a degree, but they don't, and, and I'm hoping they don't, and I've been involved with a lot of meetings, you know, when we're fighting the rain, what are we going to do? Um, uh, it was, I, I had a situation with Marco Root. Marco Root, 
one of the owners of, at the time of Stafford Motor Speedway. But it was a tour race where it rained. It was, I believe it was 2004. It rained all morning and most of the afternoon. And we're trying to squeeze it in. And, and, and we, NASCAR, I was the race director at the time, we had, we had some issues with, with the racetrack not being safe to run in. And uh, Mark Aru got, got in his, his, his SUV, and Ed Cox and I climbed in, and we went on the racetrack to survey it. And, and, you know, Ed Cox was like, you know, Mark, I don't, I don't think we could, we could do it. Look at this racetrack. And, and we came out of turn two, because we were just cruising around talking, because we needed a place where we could talk when there was nobody around. And all of a sudden, he comes off a of turn two, and he hits the gas pedal. We went down the back stretch at, like, I don't know how fast. All, all I knew was I quickly put my seatbelt on. And we get to where, you know, turn three is going to come. And I'm like, we're going to slide into the fence. The three of us, we're going to be killed. And we made that race, the turn on the racetrack and, and, and to turn, actually turn three. And, and, and Mark Root was so frustrated because he had a lot of pre-sales and he had a lot of advertising money put into this and, and into this event. And to, to cancel it, 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 it would have been, you know, it would have been tough. And in his mind, and, and his track crew track told him the track was good, and we went on a racetrack in his truck, and, and we made that turn. And you know, ultimately, we, we raced. Uh, there were one or two teams that refused to race, and uh, Howie Brody was one of them, and I have a lot of respect for the decision he made that day, and he left. He wasn't racing on that racetrack. Um, uh, Howie Brody, a local guy in Long Island who was, who was doing some tour events at the time. And, as a race promoter, he, he, what does he do? I mean, he, he, it's a fine line. It's a definitely a fine line of, of what happens in, in that and how that works. But um, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a tough call to call a race. You know, some racetracks I appreciate it. You know, they'll, they'll call it based on a forecast that, that looks when you have a 100% chance of rain and it's going to be, you know, not good. Yeah, I, you, know, you got to call it. But when it's like a 40 or a 50, even a 60, you know, you got to hope it's going to miss you. And you got to hope that the people come. That's all I'm saying. Anyway, we're going to take a break and we come back. We'll, uh, we'll uh, go into another subject because I think we beat this one to death. We'll be back. advertising has changed. Radio, TV, and newspaper revenues have declined drastically. Why? Because businesses have realized that advertising return on investment isn't what it used to be. So what can we do about it? Well, that's easy. Advertise online. Own a local restaurant, real estate agency, or even a national retail chain? Whatever your business, in radio can get your message out there. And we can do it at a fraction of the cost. Call today and see the difference for yourself. This isn't TV. This isn't radio. This is in radio.com. Hey, Beatle fans, I'm Glenn Calderon. And I'm Lucy Diamond. Join us every Tuesday night from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time for Beatles Across the Universe. On InRavio.com. Broadcasting to the world. Catch, Catch us. us.
Tony. And I'm Dan, and you're watching... Dear Dad. Oh, wait, you're not watching it yet, but you should be every Thursday at our new time from... 7 to 8? That's the new time. Dear okay. Dad on Enravio.com. Only in Enravio.com. Where else could it be? Tune in. On the internet. back. See, Silverback is, is on, s sitting, resting at home comfortably. Had a nice chat with Silverback the other day. Always good to chat with the Silverback. Um, anyway, hey, so the, the saga of my missing NASCAR license has been resolved. I had thought it was uh, some stuff that was going on, but uh, I got to thank Jimmy Wilson for his due diligence. Um, it, it turned out when I, I submitted my NASCAR license paperwork and, and pay the, the fees to be a NASCAR wheel and modified to a driver. Um, apparently, I guess, through the rules and regulations internally, um, all driver license applications for touring series go to the resume committee just to make sure this, this individual is approved. And, and I wasn't, and I'm not, still. So, um, somewhere it fell through the cracks, and what, what I guess what was supposed to happen was I was supposed to be issued a crew license until I met the criteria for a driver. Um, it didn't happen, and, um, but it's happened today. So it's all fixed, a lot of folks will wonder. And I know, I know um, Silverback and I had discussed that a while back, and I was kind of thinking that, wow, they really don't want me to be here, but it was just one of those things. So I gotta, I gotta thank Jimmy Wilson for that. So um, those of you who are down in North Carolina and, and listening and, and reporting, um, you know, you could tell him I said thank you on national internet where we reach out to 7.2 billion people in the world. So, uh, anyway, um, yeah, so back in, it was the same when you, yeah, um, but I don't know. And, uh, but yeah, there was, there was, you know, you go back, you know, go back in the day, and I, I, I can remember as an official one time, it, might, it was my first year, I, I want to share this. It was my first year as an official, and it was running late. And, and, and there was a time, there was a curfew, and you, know, you had till 11 o'clock. You couldn't start an event till 11. And the Modifieds just ended, it was like five after. I'm trying to get the, the figure eights on, the Modifieds are off, you know, hoping that my watch is running fast, but it wasn't. But I'm on the phone with the promoters, and I'm, on, and I'm talking to them, I says, what do you want me to do? They say, go for it, don't worry, we'll take our chances. Well, I, I, I don't think we went to lap two, and, and the Riverhead Town Police were there. And, uh, and, and the comedies, they were good. They, they, they basically, they, they made it my fault, but they said, oh, he's a new guy, he's a new head guy, and, and, and um, he, he was unaware. He just, his, his deal is just to kick the cars on and off the track. He wasn't paying attention to time. So I, I don't think there was a fine that night. There was like a warning, you know, if this happens again, it'll be a big fine. And, and we ended up getting the races in, but uh, um, it, it's, it's, those are the things that happen. You, you got to do, you know, you got to do. Um, but Silverback going to another doctor. Silverback is still recuperating from that, that wreck he had many, many months ago, still sitting home recuperating. And uh, although the healing process is slow, he's still, uh, still in the recliner. He's still not working. He's still not in the race shop where he's needed, and he's still not at the race tracks where he's needed as well. But uh, this is a slow process. Because so. it's not only the physical injuries that, that, that get to that you gotta fix, so sometimes it's the mental ones. And uh, sometimes they take the longest time to heal, but uh, Silverback, I'm sure, will be back, no pun intended, uh, will be back uh, soon because we, uh, we, 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 we need it. We miss him. We miss him because, well, I miss him because I'm doing things that he would be doing. But, uh, you know, just like at, at the Stafford race that we were lined up to go in the back to go racing, we had to recruit the services of somebody and... Um, and try to get them uh, to work the sign on pit road because there was nobody. It was it was me and like two other guys for two cars. So anyway, and New York Rangers say, oh, "Yeah, how many times did we strap in, warm up the engines, get mentally ready to race, only to to park it due to the curfew?" You know, I I, I always lined up towards the back because where I was parked, I was parked in the high rent district. So by the time you know I saw cars lining up, 
I'd you know drive all the way around and go, go around. And so I was always near the back. So I see the modifieds come off because the figure it's always next. I see the modifieds go off the racetrack, and then I just oh, I didn't, you know I'm, oh the guys in front of me moving. I fire up my motor. We're ready, to, and we're making a left hand turn back to our pit stops because the show was canceled. And what I didn't think was 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 fair at the time was you know we practiced like at two o'clock. And we had our heat races around 4. And now it's like 10.30 at night, you want to go race, and, and you don't. And there were a lot of guys in, in our division in the figure race back then. They needed that payoff money to pay their parts bill or to put gas in that truck to get home. And you know, now you've, you've practiced, you've, you've raced, and next week you're buying another pit pass. So you know, that happened a lot. Uh, um, Mr. New York Ranger Stanley Cook, um, and, um, but you know what are you going to do? It, 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 sometimes it's a weather situation, sometimes it's a curfew situation, and you know you're trying to speed the show. And, and maybe that's why you know some of these racetracks they, they rush through the show and they only you know have three or four divisions racing on, on a given night, and and not you know pack the schedule where you're racing for five and six hours. Um, I, I don't agree with that. I, I think as a race fan. You know, going to a racetrack, and, and especially the casual fan, and, and, and I'm not just like a, talking about the Long Island racetrack. I'm talking about racetracks all over the country. Who, who I'm starting to look at schedules, and I see that you know, they they have five or six divisions, but they don't race every week, so they must all went to that same seminar. And, and I thought that's a bad thing, but you know, you have you, you have guys who just want to race. They want to race. They want to get in the cars and go racing, and. And then, you know, I, I, I got to look after the casual fan. The, the casual fan who, they're, they're not going to go on the internet and say, oh, let's see if, you know, I, I, I love the late models. Let's see if they're racing. No, they're going to go to the racetrack because they think the race, late models race every week. And then they're going to go there and be disappointed. And, you know, from a customer service point of view, I, I don't want to disappoint the customer because the fan is the external customer of any racing facility just as the drivers and the crews are the internal customer. So there's a fine line, you gotta keep everybody happy. You gotta keep everybody happy and you gotta juggle. You gotta juggle the balls. You gotta, gotta try to make everybody happy. And um, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. It's no easy task. And you know, everybody wants to put blame. Oh, it's the promoters, it's the officials, it's the PR guy, it's the announcer, it's the guy that sells hot dogs. They gotta blame somebody, you know. It happens, stuff happens. And I think, you know, tip of the hat to, to, to Riverhead. And I don't want this to be like a Riverhead show tonight, but, you know, the, the figure eights couldn't run a couple of weeks ago because of the weather. The, the figure eight course itself was, was just too dangerous to race. And I'm glad somebody recognized that. And those guys sat there all day. They, there was no heat racing. They qualified like at 4 o'clock, 4.30. And then they sat there. And they can't race. So... People put their heads together and say, you know what, next week we're going to go double points, double money. Now, and, and I, I know I explained this a couple weeks ago, the double point thing is not going to wash with NASCAR, it's still going to be single points. But the double money they, they give these guys, I mean, the figure eight guys are the second highest paid division at that racetrack, you know, total, total purse. And, 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 I, and I'll tell you what, if, if, if you win the figure eight championship, that means you ran up front most of your races. You're going to be in the top five of money earned, and that includes the, the guys that drive these modifieds and get, you know, $1,000, $1,250, $1,300, you know, in, in their purse. I believe it's $1,450 to win unless there's a special thing, and it could be a little bit more. And, and I'm not sure what second pays, but, you know, when you, when you look at a, a modified guy who races 18 weeks, let's say, and, and I'm talking about it when, back in my day, because there was 20 weeks of racing, but there was two tour shows, so the, the modifieds are off, technically. Um, so they had 18 grades. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know, so I don't know. I, I don't know. It's all good. But anyway, we're going to take another commercial, take a break, and we come back. We'll, uh, we'll talk about some of the stuff that's going on in, in the touring series and, and also in the top three. And we'll talk about the Chevrolet duel with the Indy cars in Detroit. We'll be back. Did we lose them? Hey, 
Hey, this is Gina Cotillo from The Gina Show. Come join us every Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for celebrity interviews, reality reel with Billy Charles, funny, funny stories with Brian Guineer, and much, much more. The Gina Show can be found only on InRadio.com, broadcasting to the world. So come and catch us. For 60 years, Hanson Carpet has put the customer first, providing only the finest quality products and service. And Hanson Carpet is so much more than just carpet. We also carry a wide selection of window blinds and shades, and our licensed and insured technicians can service any of your flooring or window covering needs. Browse our huge selection of laminate, carpet, linoleum, vinyl, and tile. Stop by our showroom today or visit HansonCarpet.com. No matter what your project, Hanson Carpet has got you covered. Advertising has changed. Radio, TV, and newspaper revenues have declined drastically. Why? Because businesses have realized that advertising return on investment isn't what it used to be. So what can we do about it? Well, that's easy. Advertise online. Own a local restaurant, real estate agency, or even a national retail chain? Whatever your business, in Radio can get your message out there. And we can do it at a fraction of the cost. Call today and see the difference for yourself. This isn't TV. This isn't radio. This is in Radio.com. Hey, this weekend, uh, the, uh, the Indy cars uh, raced the Chevrolet Duel at Detroit. Um, I actually tried to watch it. I actually tried to watch it. And um, I, I guess the hard part of, of the, of, for me anyway, of watching Indy cars race, especially on the road courses, to me, there's no recognition. I have no driver recognition. There's no sponsor recognition. Um, 
It was boring. They were on a road course in, in Detroit. And, 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 and the point that I had it on, it was on both days, I kind of did a little watch of it. It, it just it was a parade. There was really no passing. Um, most of the excitement was on pit road, and I think it's just amazing how they press buttons, the cars lift up. And, and, and even the, the, there was a camera over the driver's shoulder and watching them uh, it, you know, drive, and it was like watching them play a video game. You know, they're shifting with buttons and levers and on the steer wheel, and um, it just wasn't, I don't know, it's, it's just not for me. I mean, it, it's, I guess there's a following, there's a, a big following, but it's not, not me, indie cars. It, not like it used to be in, back in the day, back you know, in the 60s and the 70s, you knew the drivers, you knew the names. There was a, and, and it wasn't racing on, on TV every, all the time. You got your racing back then on Wide World of Sports, on ABC's Wide World of Sports, and it was just highlights, just highlights. But now, you know, I guess when you watch the whole thing, it's not the highlights. But anyway, um, the Chevrolet duel at Indy, I mean, at Detroit for the Indy cars, um, you know, I'll give you the top ten. Will Power, and this, this is segment one. It was, it was in two parts. I guess this is part one. Will Power won that one. Graham Rejo was second. Tony Kanaan was third. Justin Wilson was uh, fourth. Helio Kashinovis was fifth. Uh, James Hinchcliffe was sixth. Carlos Munoz was seventh. And Carlos Heredes was eighth. Charlie Kimball was ninth. And Mario, uh, Marco, I'm sorry, woo, Marco Andretti was tenth. In the second seg segment, Helio Kashinovis was first, Will Power second, Charlie Kimball third, Scott Dixon was fourth, James Hinchcliffe was fifth, Simon Pagnaud is sixth, uh, McCall Allison was seventh, Carlos Munoz was eighth, Tony Kanan was ninth, and Brian uh, Briscoe was uh, rounded out the top ten. So it was tough for me to, to get into it. I'm watching, I'm watching, uh, I switch to the Yankee game, and I go back, and, you know, uh, um, and, and yeah, I didn't see the list. So I guess it's, everybody's just kind of riding around saving their equipment, I guess, and, and then they go nuts racing. But it just, I, I don't know. I can remember watching the Indy Cars race at Indy, of course, uh, the Milwaukee Mile. I remember watching them race at. Uh, it, it was just a whole different thing. I, 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 I loved the 3x3 three three start. You know, 3x3 you, three three start, you, you're like, I don't know. 14th, you're like the middle of the middle. I mean, man, think about that. Think about it as a race car driver. You know, you got cars all around you, three in front, three in the back, one on each side. Where are you going to go? You know? And those cars, they're, they're not designed to, to take a bump. So once they get hit, they're, they're done, they're finished. But the Indy cars, you know, and, and it's a whole different thing. I've never gone to an Indy car race. I, I saw Indy Lights, and I believe, I'm trying to remember where I saw them, because you know, after a while, all the racetracks blend. I've been to so many. I, I think it was at Thompson, I think. No, Indy, in, in Indy, um, New Hampshire. And, and wow, they were fast. They were fast. And you could see, I, in fact, I think it was up in the flag stand, because, you know, I used to just go up there to watch sometimes. And uh, I remember, like, when the Supers were at, at Thompson one time, I got, I got actually, the guy told me in the flag stand, you might, you might want to hold on. And yeah, I'm good, I'm good. And next thing I know, the, the cars went by me, and I went from the left side of the, the flag sent to the right side, just from the, the, the I guess, the ripple, the, the, the rip of the wind, or the, or the wake, I guess you could call it. But you could see it in New Hampshire. You could see the air coming off their spoilers. It was wild. It was wild. But um, anyway, anyway, Dover. The top three series were at Dover this past weekend. Um, I worked at Dover. I had a good time at Dover, and and it's a nice. It's, you know, it's, I I think those tracks are a mile, mile and third, three quarters of a mile, half mile. I think that it's that's you're separating the men from the boys here. These super speedways. That, see, you know, the cars are like rocket ships now, and and the aero packages are so good that the cars are held onto the track, and and you watch the drivers. You you know, go back to the day. There, there used to be a show on it back back in the '60s. Where they showed it, you know, inside the cars, and these drivers, they were up on the sea, up on the sea, and, and they were driving. You watch these guys today; it's, they go down a straightaway, turn, turn, go down a straightaway, and and they come out, and they're not all sweaty and not all, you know, black, you know, tired dust on their face, and you know, and their hair's neat. You know, they, I, I don't understand. The guy, guy flips end over end in, in a cup car, 
and, and he goes to the care center and he comes out and his hair is still combed, you know, and there's no, there's no dirt in his face. You know, back in the day, the guy won the race, you know, you, you could barely make out who he was. He, you know, the wore the goggles and that stuff. You know, I, I really think old time racing was, 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 it's no comparison. And, you know, I, I kind of wish, because a lot of those races were televised by ABC's Wild Water Sports. And, you know, looking back, they still, I'm sure somewhere in the archives, you know, they had the tins, because they were purpose on tins. I don't know if they digitized all this stuff. You know, somebody should go find them and put them on a channel, whether it's a current channel or make a new channel, for the old time racing. I, I, I think there were so many people that would watch that. And not only the cup stuff, because I know that they had, um, um, the, the, they called it the, the Bush Grand National back then, which is now nationwide. They had those series, those guys racing. And you know, they had a lot of late model stuff back then, because that was big, you know. The late models were real big back in the day. Um, you know, you, you, you built a late model, your local racetrack, you, you go race at the other places. You, know, you might not have had the same motor, but you can go racing. But you look back in those days, and, and that's when racing was so different because the guys who raced them usually built them. The guys who raced them sometimes wrecked them. And the guys who wrecked them most times put them back together. And, and I think that's one of the issues today that, that bothers me with the younger generation of race car driver. Um, they, they, don't, they don't work on them. You know? they, don't, they don't work on them. They don't build them. Um, some can't even give you feedback. You know, uh, uh, and, and you're right, Silver, back then. I guess they, they dust them off in, in, in the care center. Maybe that's why they all have to. Guy spins. Oh, got to take a ride in the care center. The yellow comes out for you. Take a ride to the care center. So I guess when you're interviewed, you know, you got a chance to comb your hair and, and, and wash your face off. But, and I'm only I'm being facetious here, but um, I, I don't like to see anybody crash and get hurt. But, you know, back in the olden days, I mean, the, 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 the trophy queen would kiss the winner and then she'd get, like, her face with her grease marks on them or the tire dust or whatever, that black stuff that ended up all over their face. Um, but it, it was a different racing back then. It was a different racing. There was people were pushing and shoving and beating and banging and not wrecking them, but they were muscling you. You, you, had, to, you had to know what you were doing. And again, you know, again, these young guys coming in today, um, they've been racing since they're five years old, go-karts and stuff. And who was doing all the work on it? Daddy. You know, their daddies and their mommies. And then as they got a little bit older, they, you know, they, 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 their dad's friend was coming to help out. Then they moved from, you know, go-karts to champ carts and from champ carts to, to an entry-level division at their local racetrack. And some right, right into modifies, you know. But, you know, I don't know what went on in their, in their race shops during the week. I wasn't there, but, you know, you, you see it at the racetrack. You, you, know, you, you see some of these guys, that they're sitting in the trailer, and as the team is feverishly working on the race cars, you know, whether it's the crew chief or the crew guys. And, 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 and a lot of these guys, you know, they've been with this driver since he first started. And I always kind of wonder, I, 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 I'm very careful about asking this question. I ask a guy who's racing, you know, especially when, like, I, you got a family that has four guys, four boys. Well, how come he's racing in a touring series, let's say, and he's not? And how come these two are only racing at their local racetrack? And you know, I always wonder that. What? Well, why is that? You know, who 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 decides that? You know, it's not like they they all race together. And I, you're better than your brother. You're going. I I, I was I always wanted to ask that. You know, if somebody, one of these days, I, I will. But, but again, you know, I don't know what goes on in the shop during the week. And, and, and I was the type of guy, and, and, and I think Silverback could tell you, I, you know, I, I, I do what I, I have to do, and I, I do what, what I can. And um, I'm, I'm not totally dumb when it comes to mechanics of a race car. I'm, I'm totally dumb when it comes to mechanics of a, of a race engine. But I wrecked so many times in the early days, in the 70s and the 80s, that I got good at putting it back together. You know, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, New York Rangers, Stanley Cup, I have four girls and, and three of them raced. They raced, you know, go-karts and champ-karts. Um, 
Um, and, and it was a good time. I look back on it, we had some good times um, that when, when we were racing. Uh, and my daughter, of course, raced at, at Riverhead. And, um, and she did some playing up at Thompson, too. And we used to go up on Sundays. But fun times. But you know, the, the kids of today, and, and, and I can remember talking to, to a driver one time, a driver a young guy. And I'm going to take his car out. Because the car owner asked me to take the car out. I said, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. He goes, you know, I need some feedback. I'm not getting enough feedback from this driver. Oh, okay. And, and I can remember asking the, the, the driver some stuff, you know, about the car and, you know, what is it like to go into enter the corner? Where do, you, where do you get on it? You know, what are you doing? Because I, I, I didn't want to go out there and wreck his race car. So I went out there, and, 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 I, and I'm hearing stuff, and I'm hearing noises, and I'm like, hmm. And, and I said to him, I, I came in, I said to the car, the, the car one, I said, um, and, and I'm not sitting there trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm Mr. Wonderful, I'm not, but I'm just trying to tell the story here. And, and the guy, I, I went into, I find him at full speed, and, and I go into turn one, and I hear the right noise coming out of the right front, just in front of the door. Just, just in front of the door, but behind the wheel. I hear this bang. And then I get on it, going, coming off the corner, and I hear the same bang, but it's behind the, the driver's side door in front of the wheel. This went on for like eight laps. I'm like, something's not right. So I pulled in and I said, you hear that bang? It's a bang every time you go in. He goes, yeah, I heard it. I said, I think there's a problem. Well, they, they you know, put the jack, car in jacks and they climb underneath. And sure enough, that the, the chassis, the right front part of the chassis where, where it came to the firewall, and the left part right before it does the kick up to, for the rear, was like destroyed. Every time we went into the corner, the weight transfer transferred it on. So whatever setup he had or didn't have in this race car was thrown in the garbage because it was riding on the chassis rails. It wasn't riding on the, on the shocks and utilizing the shocks and springs and the tire, the tire patch and air pressure. Um, you know, kind of similar to, I was watching a guy in a Legends race a couple of weeks ago. Guy's coming along. I'm not gonna say who it was, it doesn't matter. And the guy's coming along real good, you know. He, he was, you know, in the back of the Packer last year, and now he's, now he's, you know, working his way through the field. And, and I noticed something that I made the same mistake of back in the '80s when, when I was finally qualifying and making races. And I'm out there in practice one day, and, and I'm only telling this because I used this experience to help this guy. I'm out there in practice. And I'm coming, I'm going to the corner, and I, I wasn't, how, how do I put this? Because I, I, I got to put it in terms that a non-racer would understand. First of all, when you come off the corner, you don't mash the gas pedal. You don't do that. You, you, you got to do it with a rhythm. And you, you hope that when you're at a certain point, you're, you're, you're at full throttle. And then you don't just lift off because it just throws the car out of shape. So I was doing that, number one. Number two, I was going through the, the corners and I was feathering the gas and the car was just wop, 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 wop. I wasn't letting the shocks and the springs and the jack and bolts and everything and the tires and the patch and, and do the thing. And I wasn't letting the weight transfer properly. So the, the guy says to me, he goes, what are you doing? What's this? What's this? I said, what's what? What's wop, 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 wop. I didn't understand what he was talking about. So the next practice, I kind of just stood there and watched other people. And nobody was doing what, at least none of the guys that were running good were doing that. And it took me a long time to learn that. So I'm watching this guy in the Legends, and that's what he's doing. Every time he, 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 could, he was passing people in a straightaway, but he passed two and he lose three in the corners because he was doing that wop, 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 you know, going around the corners. So I, I went up to him and, and I said, hey, so like, you're, you're, you're looking good. I says. Take it for what it's worth. I just want to let you know, I, I learned this the hard way. I said, don't play with the gas pedal. Lift real slow, get on it, and then get on it and go, and you'll have a better run. Well, I just saw in, in his, his Facebook page, he, he had a much better run. Now, I'm not saying he had a much better run because I told him to do that, but I'd like to think that. You know, it's like, you know, I, 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 it's kind of funny. You know, like the Earl Weaver, I couldn't make the major leagues. I said, Earl Weaver, longtime manager of the Baltimore Orioles won a championship with him. Um, couldn't make the major leagues as a player, but one of the best managers there were because he took the stuff that he learned as a player and infused it into his players. 
the stuff that he learned, the reasons he didn't make it to the, to the show, to the big time. Um, some guys could do it and some guys could teach it. I'm one of those guys that I could teach it. And hopefully when I get that opportunity, um, you know, could do that. And, and you're right, the, the, triple, the, the, the triple disc clutch, say that three times, says, lets you, you know, you let off and, and you can because that, that rotating mass for those on a, a triple disc clutch, it's, it's about this big. It's about this big. And it, it, it's probably a third of the weight of a, a conventional clutch. It weighs about 11 pounds with, with all the stuff in it. And where a conventional clutch is like 32, 33 pounds. So think about rotating mass. And it takes a long time to get 32 pounds to, to start to rotate. And just when it starts rotating where you need it to be, you, you got to back off. And it takes a long time to slow down. Whereas the little one, it's the rotating mass is, is that much different. Yeah. Um, but uh, that was something to learn, too, when, when I went from a conventional clutch to a, you know, to a, a, a triple disc. And then when we went from the triple disc back to the quartermaster, at least, nah, that's a whole other story. I think I did share that. Um, but those are the things, those are the things that, that you, know, you help another guy, you help another guy. And even as an official, I, I would talk to people. I didn't do too much of that talking on the tour because by the time a driver got to the tour level, he had like a million laps somewhere. Um, they didn't need any advice from Joe. Um, so I listened. And I learned, and I watched, and I learned, and um, you know some of the things that 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 I did not, you know, understand. I crawled underneath every one of these race cars on the tour for for three or four years as an undercarriage personage. And now I'm on the other side of the fence, and you get to utilize some of the stuff you saw, and some of the stuff that you learned. You know, now I'm on the other side, and, and I'm doing that. And um, even looking at uh, tire sizes, because I, I watch a lot, I, I observe, you know, um, I observe what's going on, and and I'm like, wonder, you know, it's it's kind of funny. Like, we'll take a thing like wheelbase. I was a wheelbase guy for like two or three years. In addition to doing undercarriage, I think that was done on purpose. I got to like the, you're gonna crawl underneath 40 modifies, and then you're gonna check, you know, 80 wheelbases because there's two on each car. And you know, a lot of physical stuff. So I'm watching the top runners, the top 10 guys that are in the top 10 every week. I'm like, let's see. I'm making mental notes, their wheelbase. Wow, those guys are within an eighth or sixteenth of an inch of each other, both sides. Now you get the, the, the mid-pack guys. They're all over the place. But then you got the back guys. They're, man, they're totally, totally no good, you know? And um, so you learn. And I, I saw a lot of race cars over the years. I saw, I teched a lot of race cars. And, and you look at certain things, you look at things like wheelbase, you know, uh, or as one person said to me um, not too long ago, you know, on, on the short track, you take the brake out of the left front. Oh. Um, thank you, Silverback. Um, <laughs> You take the brake out of the front, because then when you do hit the brake, the car's going to turn on its own. I had things I didn't realize, you know. Um, I mean, the rules say you have to have four working brakes. Well, if you jack the car up, in the wheel, hit the brakes, yeah, it's going to stop. But when you have that pressure on it, when it's rolling, you know, it's not going to. And that was the other thing I noticed, you know, too, with, with the pushing of cars. I'm, you know, when teams are pushing their cars through the garage area and, and the modifieds, anyway. Um, I watch the cars that roll so free over the scales, even at the impound. Not that it's, it's pre-tech and all that nonsense where they pull the axles out. These cars are rolling so free, and that they cruise on pit road, and when they use their, their um, stagger boards, they could push the car up by themselves, where other guys they need like, you know, help pushing the cars up. And I'm saying, wait, if the car's rolling free in the garage, it's rolling free on the racetrack. If it's not rolling free in the garage, there's something binding up, there's something not right. You, know, you got to look for stuff like that, and, and, and if you don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't know, you know, I, I, I can tell you what a race car needs. I can't make it happen, uh, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm good with feedback. I remember asking my daughter, "What's the car doing?" I don't know. It's making noise. What kind of noise? I don't know. Where's the noise coming from? I don't know. And every once in a while, I'd squeeze my because I was a big guy. I squeeze myself into a, a race car, and oh, okay, now I know what it's doing. All right, we could fix that. We could change that. And it wasn't a lot that you could change on a blunderbuss, but we had our ways. 
We had a ways. Maybe someday I'll show the guy some of the stuff that's on that car if he hasn't discovered it already. Um, and, and not that I put it on. I don't know. The guy I bought it from put it on. Um, but then, then again, you know, there's guys that have more, more tricky stuff than I had. So. But anyway, but uh, they had a good old days. But uh, yeah, we got Stafford. Stafford's coming up. I'm going to try, try it again. Try number three. I, I don't think I could make it to this one. I, it's, it's just tough. And, and for, for those who are listening, you know, what I do, I have to put in a schedule. I had to put my race schedule in as soon as we got it. And they kind of, the company works around my works, my race schedule. And rainouts are a pain in the neck because then I got to find coverage. I got to find a person. And um, sometimes that's not easy. Last week, again, I, I could have left after work, which I'm so glad I didn't. I would have been very upset to get up there and be rained out. But this week, I'm in the same boat. I'm in the same boat this week. I, I don't have coverage. So, so I, need, I need Silverback maybe to, to, to get on that little uh, mechanic stool on wheels and, and go do what he has to do. But, uh, but uh, I don't know, I, I don't know. But you know, Wade's pretty good. Uh, Wade Cole, the car owner, the 83, and driver, the 33. Um, I, I watched him mount tires. He mounts tires faster than a tire machine. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. Anyway, I think we're going to take another break, and we come back. Uh, we'll talk about Dover for the Cup and the Nationwide guys and and things of that nature when we come back. For 60 years, Hanson Carpet has put the customer first, providing only the finest quality products and service. And Hanson Carpet is so much more than just carpet. We also carry a wide selection of window blinds and shades, and our licensed and insured technicians can service any of your flooring or window covering needs. Browse our huge selection of laminate, carpet, linoleum, vinyl, and tile. Stop by our showroom today or visit HansonCarpet.com. No matter what your project, Hanson Carpet has got you covered. and the Killing Devils, alternative progressive rock like you've never heard before. Over a million views on YouTube. New York City Village Voice says Paul is a gifted singer, songwriter, and musician with one of the best progressive rock bands on the planet. LA Underground Music Exchange calls him the only modern American band to cover every genre well. Pick up the albums Black Widow Tears, Red Spider, and The Wizard's Dawn, now on iTunes. And get to Facebook.com forward slash Killing Devils to keep up with the latest info.
This is Gina Cotillo from The Gina Show. Come join us every Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for Celebrity Interviews, Reality Reel with Billy Charles, Funny Funny Stories with Brian Guineer, and much, much more. The Gina Show can be found only on InRadio.com, broadcasting to the world. So come and catch us. There's always talk about when racetracks you know, getting handed down from generation to generation. I know uh, uh, Don Honig uh, passed it on to his son, who's now his grandson's kind of run the place and, and make it in a motorsports park, or have made it a motorsports park. The place is really shaping up real good. And then you have the Aroots and you know, Jack Aroot, who's a longtime patriarch of Stafford Motor Speedway. And, and now it looks like Mark and his, and his wife, Lisa, are pretty much are running the place. Um, with, with Brother Jackie, kind of, um, I, I believe Jackie's president, but but uh, I think that the weekly operation of racetrack falls into Mark's hands. Um, Jackie Root announced it, on, on, you see him on TV and ABC and ESPN and sometimes Speed, but, uh, um, uh, but uh, anyway. Yes, Silverback, how are going? Good, good talking. I'm, I'm glad to see you coming along, but anyway. Um, so it's you know what what happens to these race tracks? See, when it's time that you know, when, I'm getting I'm thinking so fast that the words aren't coming out. Uh, uh, race tracks been around forever, and people wonder like 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 Waterford. You know Waterford, it's 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 up for sale, but it's it's up for sale for more than the appraised price. And and here's what I think. Not that anybody cares, but here's what I think. I believe that the place is up for sale for three million, but it has an appraised value of two million. Um, the property's worth a heck of a lot more as something other than a racetrack. So what, what happens is, is the, the group that owns it now or um, runs it or whatever, because I'm not sure about the internal politics of that, uh, his, as, as a businessman, this is what I'm thinking they're looking to happen, goes into foreclosure. They reorganize, get a new they go back and reorganize, get a new corporation, and then they, they buy it at a scratch and dent sale price, which gets them out of their big note, and it gives the opportunity to keep it a racetrack. Because you know, whoever buys this, if somebody decides, hey, look, it's only worth $3 million, the bank's only going to give me $1.5 million, so I need to come up with a million and a half my own money. Uh, if I got to do that, I'm, I'm going to make it something that's going to be profitable 52 weeks out of the year. I'm not hoping that that, that happens. Um, whereas all the local racetrack here on Long Island, it, it's on what they call Route 58, Old Country Road. You know what I mean? And and some people think it's more, it's 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 worth a lot of money. Um, you know, I mean, it is. There's a lot of acreage there, and, but a lot of it's unusable acreage. Now, years ago, when I first started, when I first went to Rivet Raceway back in the early 70s, you know. Hopping in the car, my grandfather driving us out there. It took forever to get out there because there was the expressway ended at Betts Highway and Sunrise Highway had lights on every every corner. It seemed like you know, so you you, you shot out there and, and and it took it took a good hour to get there from Babylon. 
There was nothing there. And back in the early 80s when I was a UPS driver, I did that route. There was a driver that, that was his route, but when he was on vacation, I did his route. And there was, there was nothing there. A couple of businesses, I remember a bag company uh, up there, um, not far from where Tanger is. I remember uh, the, the, the Hagee shop, the trailers there. I remember delivering there. I didn't know it was the same guy that raised. Um, the Roll Brothers, there was some, some companies out there that was just, and it all built up. And it seemed like it built up from around the traffic circle first and headed in both directions. Now it's like, I, I don't think there's an empty lot. You know, if it is, it's because somebody owns it and they want to do nothing. But uh, I, I know when, when I was involved with a group trying to buy it about five, six, maybe seven years ago, um, you know, we did, a, we did a lot of research, and, and the property's odd-shaped, it's weird, it was subdivided, and there's parts of it that, that, that aren't theirs, and there's parts of it that are in a, in, in, I, I, guess, um, I, I guess, a nature preserve. You can't build on it because it's, it's wetlands, that's what it is, wetlands. So you can't really build on it, so, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult to, to move. Um, and, and we threw some numbers around, and... and we, we came up with some numbers, and, and I wasn't in the day-to-day -day negotiations of it, but I was involved in, in, the, in the ownership of it. Because um, I, I had hoped that it went through and that we could have, you know, and don't get me wrong, not that it's, that it's not a good place now. It, 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 it can be, anything could be better. Um, but there were, there were some changes that we had talked about that we would do to bolster it and make um, the racing a little bit better. You, you, you got to, you know, somebody once told me, you, you got to try, you got to try. You can always go backwards. If it doesn't work, then you can go back to what was. But if, you know, I had an old boss at UPS, if he said, and he said to me one time, you know, I, my, my territory was, was struggling. I had 10% of my account base went out of business. The economy was in the tank, and, and I was still trying to do things the same way that I always did them. I was a, you know, seasoned veteran, you know. And, and he said, Joe, he goes, if you continue to do the things you did, you're going to continue to get the results that you got. And, and it made a lot of sense back then. So, you know, so what do you do? What do you do? And I'm not just saying that you do this to your local racetrack here in Long Island. Um, you know, you go into any racetrack, right? so you, you, <laughs> you got to change stuff. You got to change it up. You got to show the, the people that A, race there and the people that they plop their hard-earned money for a ticket to watch the races. You gotta show them, hey, I'm the new ownership and this is what I'm gonna do. And you gotta be fan friendly, you gotta be competitive family, and that's a f competitive friendly. And that's a fine line. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. But, you, you know, you, you, you sit down and you, you, you make a schedule and you make, decide well, who's gonna race there and who's not. What divisions you're gonna keep and which ones you're not. Which ones are gonna be filling, which ones are gonna be your, 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 your main, your, your meat and potato divisions. And, and I've always said that you need three meat and the potato divisions. You need your top feature division that, you know, that NASCAR pays the big money to. You need a middle one, and you need an entry-level one. And they need to feed. All for the the entry-level one needs to feed the, the, the middle guys, and the middle guys need to move up and feed into the feature division. And, and then the other two maybe, uh, you know, you rotate them out. And, you do such special stuff with them. Um, that's what you got to do. And then you got to have specials, you have deals, you have to, you know, I, I've always said if, if, if your facility seats 10,000 people, okay, let's say you have a 10,000 seat facility and you're charging 30 bucks a head and you're only getting 5,000 people there, you know, you know do, the, do the math. So you have, you know, you know you're making $50,000. Let's say you had, you know, again, you have 10,000 seats. I mean, uh, and, 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 and you charge half that amount, but it's full, you're making the same money. Now, I always say you need to take a look at how many people you have. You, you had 10,000 people in the stands tonight, and you made you know, 100,000 in concessions. So that means everybody's spending $10. You know they spend more than $10. So two beers are $10. But the more people you have in the stands, the more money you spend in the concessions. Yeah, a lot of the times at racetracks, the concession stands are leased out. And, and, and sometimes they're not, but in a lot of cases they're, they're leased out. They're, they're, there's a deal made. You know, you, you could rent the space, give me a piece of the action. But your concessions, are, you know, that's that's like side money. 
what you need to do is you need to have enough people coming in through the back gate to pay the purses, pay the sanction of fees, pay the point fund, pay the insurance. But then everything that comes in the front gate, the ticket sales, is the gravy. That's the profit. You shouldn't be dipping into the gravy to pay the purses and the expenses. And vice versa, you know. It's just one of those things that people need to look at. And that's what we looked at. You know? we, we had hope to be profitable, and that was our plan, to keep it a race track as long as it was profitable. And when it stopped being profitable, then you need to do something else to profit because we were businessmen. So anyway, Dover. Nationwide and a couple of trucks were there. Uh, the trucks, Kyle Busch uh, won from the pole. Ryan Blaney was second. Johnny Soto was third. Brandon uh, Jones was fourth. Uh, yeah. Joey Coulter was fifth. John Henry Nemechek was sixth. Ben Kennedy was seventh. Tyler Reddick was eighth. Jermaine Corova Jr. was ninth. Timothy Petey was tenth. Nationwide side, Kyle Busch was the winner of, and uh, we'll talk about something in a second. Trevor Bain was second. Joey Logano was third from the pole. Matt Kenseth was fourth. Chase Elliott was fifth. Kyle Larson was sixth. Brian Scott was seventh. Ty Dillon eighth. Elliott Sadler ninth. Reagan Smith uh, rounding out the top ten. On the cup size, Jimmy Johnson was the winner with Brad Keselowski from the pole coming in second. Matt Kenseth uh, was third, followed by Clint Boyer in fourth. Um, Denny Hamlin fifth. Martin Truex Jr., 6th, Tony Stewart, 7th, Joey Logano, 8th, Dale Earnhardt Jr., 9th, and Paul Menard, 10th. Um, Jimmy Johnson pocketed uh, just, just over $331,000 for the win in the Cup Series, and whereas Kyle Busch in the Nationwide Series uh, only pocketed $43,590, which was less than what last paid in the Cup race. Uh, In the nationwide race, there was four cautions for 27 laps. So basically, it was almost seven laps for every caution, which I had said earlier, six to seven laps for every caution. And in the, in the cup race, it was eight cautions for 41 laps, so that was a little over five um, laps per caution. That doesn't count the, the red flag uh, situation. Uh, looking at the points, Matt Kenseth has a two points lead over Gordon, but it really doesn't matter because once you go into the chase, it's all thrown out the window and you, know, you start over. Whereas in the Nationwide Series, uh, Reagan Smith has uh, a four point lead over Elliot Sadler. Elliot Sadler, always right, right up there. I'll tell you what, there's, there's a guy that should be in a cup car. I, I had the opportunity to play golf with him a few years ago, and uh, not that we talked about any of that stuff, but. You know, it's the politics of racing, man. It's the politics of racing. I think the guy should be in cup. There's some guys in cup that shouldn't be. Just my opinion. Not that anybody cares. Just my opinion. But uh, that's the way I see it. But, you know, the series, I believe, goes to Pocono this, this upcoming weekend. And, and that's, the, well, that's the next event, Pocono. And I, uh, Pocono, that's a place I've, I've been to a few times. And uh, very interesting place with the, the three corners. And, and I always like uh, talking about Pocono. It's hard to see the far little corner way out, way out, even from the suites where I watch the races for most of the time. It's just hard to see out that way. Um, and then if you're, you, you're in the, if you're not up in the suites and you're down low, you, you're only really seeing what's going, going in front of you because the, the straightaway, the front stretch is so long. It's so long. But interesting racing. You know, it's a combination uh, of, of things that, that make it happen. But, but Dover, I love Dover. I worked some races at Dover. Worked a nationwide race there, a K&N race there. And uh, what, what TV doesn't show is, like, one of the straightaways goes downhill, another one goes uphill. And you approach the corner so much different. A lot of people don't realize that. See, back in those days when they built those tracks in, in, the, in the 50s and in the early 60s, they, they had a plot of land that they had to deal with. And... It wasn't cookie cutter. It wasn't all symmetrical. There were so many things that changed the layout of a race course back in those days. Sometimes it was you know, they couldn't get through the rock, or sometimes there was water in the way, or maybe a river ran through it, or whatever the case may be. So the, the tracks are a little little different in the way they were. And uh, I never knew that, that Dover went you know, downhill, one straightaway and uphill and the other, until I actually worked the race there and I was watching. I was like, I thought it was an optical illusion. I really did. And, and, and then there's these seats on the backstretch where 
you really have difficulty seeing the, the back stretch of part of the racetrack because those seats are designed for the horse track that's in the infield. Um, so just, just one of those things. Uh, and yeah, it's steep. Try to walk Bristol. Try to walk Bristol, the New York Rangers Stanley Cup. Bristol, I, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because you know, I worked Bristol a few times and you, you, you go through that gate up in, in the turn there. And, and it's the morning, you're early, you're all ready, you're ready to rock and roll. And you walk down, it's downhill, it's all good. At the end of the day, you've been there 15, 16 hours, you, your butt's dragging, and you just want to get back to the hotel, take a shower, grab a bite to eat, maybe. And you, you're walking up this, and it's like, oh my God. And it doesn't end there, it doesn't end there, because it goes all the way under the bleachers, all the way under the seats, out to the parking lot almost, out to the entrance way out to the parking lot. And, um, that's a tough one to walk up. In fact, they keep a, a, a payloader there when the, the haulers are leaving, that if they can't make it up the hill, they, they take them out with a payloader and a train, and a chain, they just hook it up and, and, and go and, and yank them up. And, and the, some of the, a lot of the trailers bottom out. It, it's, it's, it's an interesting place. I, you know, they, they put a pedestrian tunnel in there, but I, I, I'm surprised they haven't put a hauler tunnel in there. I guess someday, someday, I'm sure Bruton Smith will, Know, come and do that because it's a, it's a nice place. I, I love it. I had a great time at Dover. I had the opportunity to work with some good people in the, in the k and Pro Series East and, and a little bit of help I, I did for the Nationwide. Um, I, I had a lot of fun working for NASCAR. Uh, but like I said, you know, not too long ago, it, when, when it started to become a job, a job that I didn't need, when it started to become a job, it wasn't fun anymore. And um, don't get me wrong, back in the, in the old days, you know, we worked hard because we, we had twice as many cars and half the number of officials and we got the job done. And, and, and I know it's totally different now, the, the way things are done, the way tech is done. And, um, you know, there's, there's half the amount of cars and twice as many officials, but there's, there's more being looked at. And it's looked at every week, every week, sometimes, you know, each day of that weekend. And that was one of the things that I had questioned years ago. I said, you know, why do we look at, well, not years ago, but a couple of years ago, you know, why, why are we looking at certain things every day? You have a three-day event, we're looking at it the same thing every day. And then it had to do with changes. And, and, and maybe we were a little lax in what we did, because, you know, you know, going back to the, when I first was a, a touring official, um, we did a detailed, in-depth tech right before the first race, right before the icebreaker. And after that, it was basically just, just measurements, measurements and safety stuff. Every once in a while, you, you, you get the fine tooth comb out and you go over everything, but, you know, and there was a sheet and it was like, is this a new car? No, nope. all right, good. You know, then you do the, what they call the short sheet. And if it was a new car, you got the long sheet out. And, and, and then as time progressed and new people came in to, to play and to, into power, it became a, you did a long sheet every event, which, which kind of makes sense to me because they, they were, there were cars that would show up at the, at the tracks at this touring when, when, when I was the body guy. I was the exterior guy. I did all the measurements for a while. And, and I would be told, oh, you, you don't need to do this one. We, we, he, he was already done. That We did it at this shop in Jersey. Oh, okay. And then it come to a Long Island car. No, 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 you can't do this. You're friends with them. You can't. So then somebody would... And, and they refer to my, my Long Island as the Wrong Island Gang. You, know, you can't handle, you can't look at those cars from Wrong Island. And I was like, what, what do you mean? Could we feel some favor? But it was okay for them to do the, <laughs> the Jersey cars. I just couldn't do the Long Island cars. But uh, that's just, it was the politics of the game. But again, we worked hard and we played hard. We had, we had a good group of people. Everybody worked together. Um, we're all from the, uh, I was the outsider living on Long Island because most of the officials lived in New England. And uh, you, you had the Jersey group. You had, well, you, you had like five or six officials coming up from Jersey, and they were all in their little thing. And then you had the New England group that were all in a little thing. And I was somewhere in the middle. <laughs> I was somewhere in the middle. Um, you know, you make some good friends over the years. And then, you know, when, then when you go back uh, to the other side, you find out who, who your friends really are. You know, but uh, you know, some of the guys that I worked with a long time, and, and, I, and I said, I've said this a couple of times, guys, that they ate. They ate and drank in my home and, and spent time with me and, and, and my family and stuff. And, and they're still, you know, we're still friendly. But it was kind of funny. You go to the, back to the other side and, 
you go back to the competitive side, and all of a sudden things are different. Things are real different. And, uh, and just like going, going back to your local racetrack after you're the head guy, things are different, you know. And, and, and it's funny, those people that you thought were your friends, as soon as you hung the shirt out, they, they were no longer your friends. And you know, one day we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how that, how that works. You know, uh, your friends are your friends. They're going to stick by you through thick and thin. But I, I, I call them the uh, fair weather friends, you know. I go, this guy's the head guy. Let's be friends with him. Let's take the guy fishing. Oh, and double shows. Let's have the guy stay at our house so he doesn't have to drive all the way back to Babylon, which is like, you know, 48 miles one way. You know, uh, Jersey guys are friendly. Yeah, they actually are sometimes. But, uh, you know, it, you know that, that's what happened when you, when you are officially and you travel like we did in, in the time. We went from, you know, Daytona, New Hampshire, and, 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 and Tennessee, and Virginia, and where else did we go? Upstate New York. We went all over the place, New England. And, and you eat with the same people, and you, and, and you sleep at the, you know, in the hotels, and you're in the lobbies because, you know, what are you going to do? And you hang out, and you, whether you're, you're playing cards or just having a few beers, telling a few stories, sharing a few lies. Um, it, was, it was different. And then you had the, the camper people that, you know, they stuck to themselves as they were out in camper land. And, and look, they invite you out there. You'd go out, and you you could you know, do some stuff with them out there, hang out and have a few drinks, have a barbecue, whatever. But it, it was it was different, and but you know, it it changed over the years, and and that's one of the reasons why you know it was easy for me to step back, and I wanted to go back and and, and play and go racing. And uh, although I'm not behind the wheel yet, still trying to get my approvals in place. Um, I'm I'm with a good team. I'm I'm having a good time with them, having a lot of fun with them, just like doing this show. I have a lot of fun doing this show. And, I mean, hey, let's face it, I, 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 drive a, I drive a far way to come do this show. And I love it. You know, what's going on? Year three, I think um, next February will be show, show 200, hopefully. That, uh, we're still here, God willing. Um, well, when we hit 100 shows, I thought that was a big deal. <laughs> then we hit 150 shows. <laughs> I think the next celebration is going to be 200 shows, and I think we're going to make it. 200 shows. 200 shows and count. There's, there's, there's shows on TV that don't last that long, you know, because they have that short week. You know. So we do this every week just about, except when there's Monday holidays, you know. But, uh, you, know, you know, shows on TV, they start in like October and in April they're done, you know. So, so what are they talking, six months, seven months? So that's 28 weeks. So for a show to do, do 150 shows, they got to be on for like five years. You know, here we are, we're just... Uh, just keep plugging along, getting it better and better, making it better and better. We do that because of you guys, guys out there who listen in, call in, email me, and all that kind of good stuff. So, uh, and I think um, the, this is new intern here, Ben. He's helping us out. Ben, welcome. Um, he's in there with Matt and, and Bonnie. It, it's all good. I got a lot of people out there helping to make this happen. See, this is just about, I'm just the guy behind the camera. There's a lot of, lot of stuff that goes on on the other side of the camera, folks, that makes this happen. And uh, I, I always continue to thank those people and, uh, and, and, and what we got to do to make ourselves better. We've come a long way from the early days when I had my partner uh, doing the show and <laughs> working off our laptops trying to get information. <laughs> you know, when we come back, we'll have the nationwide reserves when we come back, nationwide.com. Oh, my God, man. But anyway, anyway, we're going to wrap up. It's coming to that time. I want to thank everybody for uh, um, coming on tonight. I, I apologize if I offended anybody in the earlier part of talking about some of the stuff that went on Riverhead. And, may, and maybe I wasn't objective because sometimes you got to play devil's advocate. Uh, and that's right. And I was just reminded, this is my show. I can say whatever I want within reason. <laughs> but uh, again, I, I know I upset one or two people earlier. And, and you know, I'm not going to say sorry. I'm, I'm, I, I'm just trying to put the other point of view out there. And it's not always, you know, don't always blame the officials. But uh, anyway, anyway, again, thank you, everybody, for, for coming on tonight, listening and watching. Um, I want to thank, you know, everybody for their support. And, uh, and, you know, support your local racetrack. Don't do the bashing. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. See what you can do to make it better, whether you help a team, help an official, become an official. Or just write positive things, you know. But it's all good. Anyway. 
Good night, everybody. God bless you all. Be safe and tell somebody you love them. Have a good one. Thank you.